Well, this could be a very short sermon. Do you see the problem here? If we take this verse in isolation and at face value, women should be silent in the churches. Not only should I not be preaching this morning, but women should never lead a service, read a Bible reading, lead the prayers, or even give the notices. And what about the passing of the peace? Should women be silent during this as well? Strictly speaking, should they even be allowed to sing in church? And this is not the only time the Apostle Paul seems to limit what women can do. In the first letter to Timothy, he says, he doesn't permit a woman to teach or domineer over men, but to learn in silence with submission. Why would Paul give these instructions? Many people have concluded it is because he has a problem with women. In fact, that he is a misogynist. Misogyny is dislike of, contempt for, or ingrained prejudice against women. And it's based on the assumption that women are somehow inferior or lesser than men. Well, if Paul is a misogynist, given that he wrote a great deal of the New Testament and given that quite a few passages in the Old Testament seem to give women a raw deal, that leads to the questions, is the Bible anti-women? Does it promote misogyny? Many people think so. Seth Andrews, former Christian and founder of The Thinking Atheist, says, I continue to be amazed when I see Christian women defending a Bible that denigrates women. But it's not only atheists who have a problem with this. I found this quote from a Christian woman who's struggling with it. I lost many hours of sleep blaming Paul for my doubt. If Paul really said these things, if my church believed them, how could I tell my friends about Jesus? How could I invite my loved ones to join me at the table when they might be told that God made women less than men? I struggled to see a point in having faith. If my purpose was to make disciples, I was set to fail. Christians, perhaps especially women, have lost their faith over this issue. So we need to take it seriously. Let me tell you where I'm going with this. I don't believe for a moment that Paul was a misogynist and I don't believe for a moment that the Bible denigrates women. I believe that such a view is based on a wrong interpretation of Paul and other passages. But there's no denying that misogyny exists. Even in 21st century Australia, it drives sexual assault and rape, family violence and abuse of women, whether physical, emotional, spiritual or financial. And it drives the dehumanising of women in pornography. And that is just the nasty face of misogyny. It also has a nice face. Don't you worry your pretty head about that. Women are happier when they stay in their proper place. Women lose their femininity when they try to compete with men. But these days, except in some cultures, people don't tend to come straight out and claim that women are inferior to men. Yet it was widely accepted, indeed just assumed, in both the world and in the church until halfway through last century. This is what the famous Greek philosopher Aristotle believed about women. The male is by nature superior and the female inferior, the male ruler and the female subject. That a female is an incomplete male or as it were, a deformity. But what about Christian commentators? Well, Tertullian described woman as a temple built over a sewer. Oregon wrote that it is improper for a woman to speak in an assembly, no matter what she says, even if she says admirable things or even saintly things. That is of little consequence, since they come from the mouth of a woman. The tremendously influential and respected theologian Augustine describes woman as of small intelligence and living more in accordance with the promptings of the inferior flesh than by the superior reason. Albertus Magnus didn't hold back. 
a misbegotten man with a faulty and defective nature in comparison to his. One must be on one's guard with every woman as if she were a poisonous snake and the horned devil. Aquinas too described woman as defective and misbegotten. Well, you might think, surely the great theologians of the Reformation did better than that. Unfortunately, no. Martin Luther, known for his pithy sayings, said, no gown worse becomes a woman than the desire to be wise. And John Calvin was quite clear, as the woman derives her origin from the man, she is therefore inferior in rank. On this account, all women are born, that they may acknowledge themselves as inferior in consequence of the superiority of the male sex. And this is what the best and brightest theologians of the past thought of women. So we have to acknowledge that feminists are right when they accuse the Christian church of spreading misogyny. These traditional church teachings are downright misogynist. But are they true to the Bible? Let's try to answer that question by recalling the four keys to reading the Bible that John gave us two weeks ago from Dan Kimball's book, How Not to Read the Bible. The Bible is a library, not a book. The Bible was written for us, but not to us. Never read a Bible verse. And all the Bible points to Jesus. So first, the Bible is a library, not a book. Books written in different genres by different human authors and at different times for different purposes but with a single big story, the story of God's plan for humanity. In the first sermon in this series, John showed us a rather complex diagram of this story. Here is a simplified version. If we want to know what God thinks about women, if we want to know whether the Bible is misogynist, we need to begin at the beginning of the story with creation. Genesis 1 gives us a picture of how God designed the world to be. And it tells us that as the climax of his creation, he created humankind in his own image. In the image of God, he created them, male and female. Both men and women in the image of God, not a hint of inequality, superiority and inferiority, or women being defective in any way. He gives to both of them together the command to rule the earth. And this, God declares, is very good. But there is another creation story in Genesis 2, where a woman is created after the man, because it, God says it's not good for the man to be alone. Now, this is where it gets interesting, because despite the clear message of Genesis 1, some commentators in the past, and even today, argue that Genesis chapter 2 shows that there is a hierarchy between men and women built into God's creation design. Why would they say that? The first argument is that woman is created after man, indicating that he has priority. But in the first creation story, both men and women are created after the birds, the fish and the animals. And in the second story, woman is created after the animals. Would that imply that either all humans, or at least women, are somehow inferior to animals? Another argument is that woman was made from man, so she is derived from him, and so lesser. But what was man made from? Dust. Then there's the argument that woman was made to be man's helper. In English, that word helper often implies an assistant, a second in charge, not the main player. But in Hebrew, the word translated helper is most often used in the Old Testament to refer to God. God is my helper. Certainly no notion of inferiority or being of secondary importance. Let's look again at our diagram of the big story of the Bible. We've looked at creation. 
What happens to the relationship between men and women when sin enters the world, what we often call the fall? In Genesis 3, we read that the man and the woman disobey God, and that as a result of the entry of sin into the world, three sets of relationships are affected. The relationship between men and women, humanity's relationship with the earth, and humanity's relationship with God. Referring to the first of these, Genesis 3.16 reads, To the woman he said, I will greatly increase your pangs in childbearing. In pain you shall bring forth children. Yet your desires shall be for your husband, and he shall rule over you. He shall rule over you. The harmonious relationship between men and women is distorted and spoiled. Now we see where misogyny begins. It is the result of sin. It is not how God wants things to be. Now if this is the case, we should expect to see that in God's redemption plan, he is at work to correct the state of affairs. We should see throughout the Old Testament, and particularly in the life of Jesus and the early church, a trend towards the reversal of misogyny and the restoration of God's creation design, which is the full equality of women and men. Women being treated with dignity and respect. And that's just what we do see. Of course, there are plenty of stories in the Old Testament of women being treated atrociously. But this in no way is approved by God. Rather, these stories are in the Bible to warn us of how bad things get when people turn away from God. And counter to these stories run the stories of women chosen by God and treated as equals as God originally designed. Women like Miriam and Huldah, who were prophets, and Deborah, a leader of her people. Women like Esther and Ruth, and Abigail and Jael, strong women who are held out as examples of integrity and honour. And when we come to the way Jesus regarded women, we see even more clearly that Jesus openly challenges the misogyny of his culture, both Jewish and Roman. Far from treating women with dislike, contempt or prejudice, he includes them among his disciples and treats them with honour and respect. So much so that he shocks even his other male disciples, not to mention the Pharisees and the Jewish leaders. It is to a woman at the well in Samaria that he first discloses that he is the Messiah. His disciples were disturbed that he was even talking to her. And in John's Gospel, it is a woman, Martha, who is the first to declare that Jesus is the Messiah, the Son of God. And after his resurrection, the first people Jesus appeared to were women. We come to the next key. The Bible was written for us, but not to us. This is not that tricky. Our passage from Corinthians is part of a letter written to Christians living in Corinth in the first century. It is not written to us at St. Tom's in the 21st century, but it is still inspired scripture with something to teach us. Working out what that is, though, will involve the next key to reading the Bible, which is never read a Bible verse. In other words, we have to consider the context. If the slogan of real estate agents is location, 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 then ours is context, context, context. Taking Bible verses out of context can lead to foolish and even dangerous conclusions. As this coffee mug says, I can do all things through a Bible verse taken out of context. What then are we to make of 1 Corinthians 14, 34 to 35? Women should remain silent in the churches. They are not to speak but must be in submission, as the law says. If they want to inquire about something, they should ask their husbands at home, for it is disgraceful for a woman to speak in the church. In terms of the broad context, we've already looked at the big story of the Bible, creation, fall, redemption, restoration, 
And we've seen that this rules out misogyny in the church, God's redeemed people. So we cannot interpret Paul's instructions as meaning that he thinks women are defective or inferior, and that's why they shouldn't speak. But we also need to consider the immediate context, Paul's teaching and practice, as recorded in the book of Acts and in his letters to various churches, including this one. The final chapter of his letter to the Roman church gives us important insight into the way he regarded women. He refers to and commends 29 of his co-workers, of whom 10 are women. Specifically, he speaks of Phoebe as a minister of the church and a benefactor of many. Priscilla and her husband Aquila, for whom he and all the churches of the Gentiles are grateful. Mary, Tryphena and Tryphosa, who are described as working very hard. And then there's Junia. With her husband Andronicus, she is said by Paul to be outstanding among the apostles. Are these the words of a misogynist? someone who dislikes or has contempt for women? Or consider what Paul says in his letter to the Galatians. There is no longer Jew or Greek. There is no longer slave or free. There is no longer male and female. For all of you are one in Christ Jesus. Notions of superiority and inferiority based on ethnicity, social status or gender have no place in the church. Let's hone down even more closely into the context of these verses in 1 Corinthians itself. We find that, in fact, reading these verses as saying that women shouldn't speak at all in church is completely implausible. Earlier in the letter, in chapter 11, Paul talks of how women pray and prophesy in the Corinthian church out loud. Women are clearly speaking in the church at Corinth. So how do we explain what Paul says here? There are a number of possibilities, none of which is entirely satisfactory. The first is that these verses are not part of Paul's letter at all, but were added later by someone copying the manuscript. This theory is supported by both internal and external evidence and argued by a number of respected evangelical scholars. But if Paul did write these words, he most likely was addressing a particular issue in the Corinthian church at that time. Since women were largely uneducated and the church predominantly Gentile, knowledge of the scriptures would have been poor, especially among the women. Perhaps they were disrupting the church meeting with loud questions to the preacher or to their husbands. So Paul tells them to save their questions for later. Or perhaps they were simply bored during the sermon as they couldn't understand it very well and they were chattering. We can't be sure. What we can be sure of is that Paul was not anti-women and the Bible as a whole does not promote misogyny. Let's conclude with Kimball's final key to how to read the Bible. All the Bible points to Jesus. Paul cannot be in conflict with Jesus. We cannot read anything he says as contradicting Jesus. So if we want to know if the Bible is anti-women, or promotes misogyny, we look to Jesus. No one dignifies, affirms and celebrates women like him. The new era of redemption that Jesus ushers in brings healing to this fallen world, and that includes the restoration of God's creation intention for the full equality of men and women. Let's pray. May your word live in us and bear much fruit to your glory.